Hello, and welcome to the Green Profit Academy Pros Podcast. This show digs into the challenges in growing a lawn care and landscape business while maximizing your profit. I'm Christine Era. And I'm Steve Bousquet. We are the green industry experts in profit, growth, and leadership. Hello, Christine. How are you doing today? I am good. It's a new year. We've got some beautiful white snow on the ground. I think we're going to be getting some more, uh, but it is, it's a nice new fresh year. It is. Yes. We had snow and the rain took it all away and created an incredible amount of flooding in our area. But you know, when you live in Colorado, when I think, I just think of like, you know, John Denver, Rocky mountain high white mountains. Um, so very pretty area out there. And you get consistent snow where we get snow and then rain. Yeah, we get our snowiest time is March, which people usually are surprised when they learn that. Uh, But we have been getting some snowfall, some little storms roll in, you know, dump anywhere from four to 10 inches on us and then move out. So it's a little, it started off a little heavy this year. We'll see what happens, but it's, uh, we had a white Christmas, which was nice. And now we have snow on the ground after the new year. So, but it has been cold. It is that you feel the cold. It's a different type of cold for sure. Yeah. 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 I looked at your long-term forecast. I think next Monday is supposed to be like low of one, high of 14. So that's winter. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. You're definitely bundled up. You've kind of inside and out because you could just feel the cold creeping in. Yeah. So today's episode, we're going to be talking about getting ready to launch your season, whether, you know, you're in the north or northeast or northwest when you're in the cold season and you're probably doing some type of snow work or you're completely shut down. Like some of our clients, they shut down and, you know, there's different business models for different seasons in different areas of the country. Uh, our Alabama um, clients are, you know, they're working year round, uh, but they do transition from the kind of winter season into the spring. So we're going to talk about, you know, shifting your business, launching the business into your uh, spring season. What do you need to do? Uh, maybe you're going from season to season or service to service, but you also need to stay focused. You need to have a plan and you need to be prepared. Yeah. And, you know, it's, the seasonal, you know, shift, like you said, whether you're, you're shifting from snow into lawn care or some people shut down. So I, I love this topic. It was one of the things as I really started digging into this industry, becoming more aware of and how much more work it takes in these businesses and in this industry to, you know, whether you shut down and to relaunch or shift into a new season because you're doing snow and then you're going to be moving into lawn application. Uh, Lots of hard work, lots of details involved, uh, you know, and lots of expectations too, I think of a a company like this, a business model like this of their team. And the winter, you know, we're doing a little bit of snow. We're getting ready for spring. It goes fast. It seems like you have months and months, but, you know, basically as of today for us, we're 69 days to count, you know, before we're doing production again, right? Or full-time production. So every day matters. And if you're doing, you got to get, you know, we're going to go over what you got to get worked on. It really helps to have a focused plan countdown dates, you know, uh, milestones as far as what has to be taken care of when, and also who's going to be taking care of it. And that way there is, and who maybe somebody needs a accountability partner or they need, you know, help, a little help, not to do the whole thing, but a little help, um, who needs to be on your team to get things taken care of. And there's a lot, it can be overwhelming. So writing it out, or at least having some type of list, even if it's a directional list um, to get you focused, because otherwise, you know, it can be next thing you know, it's spring and people are calling for estimates and you're still trying to work on your list. Yeah. And I think too, as you know, an owner, a manager, we all do this work, right? It's like, as the company grows, we start to delegate to other people. We don't always delegate and pass on 
the details or the expectations of the to-do list and the tasks. So I love having some sort of process and list to go over with the team. And it also can help if you are growing and maybe you're bringing on a new manager or a new person who's going to be like a team lead. This is something that you can give them and go over and say, hey, this is the timeline of when I want you to do this, or this is when this needs to get done. So I think this too helps to find some expectations and make a smooth, uh, support a smooth transition from one service delivery to another, or just coming back from not doing work at all for several months and getting your team back in the swing of things. Absolutely. And when we're bringing our team involved in this to help us or, you know, um, other one other team member shifting it to another team member, the three things that we really need to make sure that we're delivering when we're delegating or sharing this is we want to make sure that they understand the outcome of what we're trying to do, what what the outcome or desirable outcome is is expected. Um, Also, the information. Do they have all the information that they need? And then because if they don't, they're going to keep coming back to, what do I do now? What do I do now? What do I do now? And people just love that. They love to be micro questioned to death. And they also love to be micromanaged. Um, I'm kidding. No one, no one likes either one of those things. So we want to make sure that we're giving them enough information. You know, I'm guilty of not giving enough detail and enough information. So I have to be a little more thorough when I'm thinking about uh, delegating and sharing uh, tasks and responsibilities. So, and the other thing is permissions. So we need to have, make sure people have the right permissions. Like what can they spend? What permissions do they have to okay things, whether it's repairs or whether it's, um, a budgetary item, you know, what permissions, so what information, what outcomes and the and permissions do they need to proceed, proceed. Otherwise they come back to us over and over again and uh, ask us questions. And that's where I, I heard it twice this week. All right. It's just easier if I do it myself. It's just simpler and quicker if I, if I do it myself. So we want to get away from that, especially when we already have a full plate and it's going to get fuller as the season approaches. Yes. So some of the things, and we're going to be sharing at the end of this, how you can get a hold of a checklist uh, for a seasonal checklist. So stay tuned for that. And that's going to be a, a giveaway if you're interested in downloading this checklist. So the first area that we're going to talk about is equipment and tools. You know, with launching, whether you're in a lawn or a landscape company, launching or shifting into a season, you've always got to pay attention to your equipment and tools. You know, they're what helps you get the job done. They're, you know, what your team leads leans into. And if something goes down or it's not functioning, we all know all you're going to be doing is losing money at that point. And you want to pay attention to kind of the big rocks with your tools. You know, we don't have to have everything perfect on every piece of equipment, but you definitely want to make sure, you know, it's operatable and the tires, the engine, the uh, cooling system, transmissions for trucks, mowers, your uh, spreader sprayers, you know, hoses, wear points. And, uh, you know, we have found just creating a checklist of what broke during the year or during the season and making sure that that is absolutely ready to go, either replaced or new uh, for the start of the season. And we have certain items that we are just wear items that we want to replace, like the impellas on our spreader sprayers, right? Or there are certain tires that we know we want to replace. And uh, how do you know how to replace a tire when it's due, right? They have these simple gauges that you can get and just check. But you want to have someone that's responsible for checking that because you don't want to have to pull a crew off in the middle of May or get a flat tire or create an issue in the middle of May when, you know, everything's going to replace a tire that could have been or should have been replaced in um, in February. And very much like, you know, people do a lot of bank balance uh management of their company, you know, and that's why we advocate, uh, really advocate for profit first, um, because the money is dispensed more evenly. You don't want to be repairing and maintaining your equipment based on your bank balance. You want to have that money set aside and scheduled. So it's maintained, repaired and replaced when it needs to be, and not just on your bank balance. Yeah. So keeping some sort of maintenance schedule is ideal making sure that you're looking at the bigger pieces of equipment that you're going to be using before you launch your season. 
So, you know, if it's mowers or sprayers or anything like that, you know, your truck's making sure that they're in good working condition. That's why I think keeping a log of your maintenance schedule is really good. And then the other thing is, is, you know, do you have everything that you need? Was there something broken or lost during the the shift of the season or when you guys were closed down? And is your team going to be ready to go? You know, you don't want on the day that you guys are being sent out on a job not to have, you know, the gloves or, you know, your wheelbarrow or shovels or various things that they might, might not have communicated that, hey, you know, this broke right on the last job at the end of the season. Uh, yeah, I forgot to tell someone. So making sure that someone is the champion of your inventory, you know, supplies when it comes to your equipment for your team. And when we start back up, we always have our practice week where we go out and do jobs that are either very close to the shop so we can find out, you know, oh, when we put that away in the winter, it was actually fine. But now we take it out to use it for the first job and it the handle breaks. And it just always happens. Uh, it's no one's fault. We just know it's going to happen. So that first week, we definitely plan jobs that are close to the shop or uh, at customers' houses that we have, you know, easily accessible uh, ways to get there, and or they don't mind if our crews practicing a little bit on their properties. And uh, so I'm a big, you know, a big proponent of practicing because if professional football players and professional teams have to practice, you know, we we can expect our teams to do a little practice or our guys and, and uh, women to do some practicing for this production. So you know, not having the expectation that day one, they're going to go out and do this high production job, maybe give them a couple of days of like spring training uh, on a job to see what's broken, what's working and what's not. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. It's that practice, like we'll even practice, you know, having certain conversations as well. Like, you know, when we do coaching and we'll practice hey, let's have a tough conversation because tough conversations come in leadership and management, you know, or if somebody is just getting into a new area of their job, we'll practice that and we'll role play. And that's something, um, you know, when I first started doing it, I absolutely hated any sort of role play or practice. But the more that I did it and the more that we've done it with their team, the more comfortable they are and the more fun they have and confidence they have going into, you know, a new role or a job. And, you know, it's, it just makes it fun. It's connective and it gives them that confidence that they may be lacking and not communicating. Right. Yeah. And you don't want to be practicing on people's homes that are paying top dollar, you know, having practice at your home, at your shop, your office, um, your family's homes, you know, uh, have them practice, practice, practice. That's how people get better. A lot of it, you know, the old school, get in a truck, go to work. Uh, they should know how to do this. I don't know. That doesn't work anymore. Right. You have to train, teach and coach people and practice is a big part of that. I know coach Saban just retired from Alabama, but I mean, they practice all the time. And um, those teams, you know, they're the top college football players in uh, the country, but they practice and practice and practice and game time comes the coaches on the sideline uh, helping them and, and training and coaching them even more. So you know, if they can do it, I think uh, we can do it with our, our team. And that's always been my position in that. And it creates less broken equipment. It creates higher quality. It creates uh, less turnover. There's a lot a lot of more confidence when they get to the job because they've done it, you know, multiple mm -hmm. times before they're showing up at somebody's house. Um, so if you're able to practice, get some practice in as you start the season. The second is, uh, you know, we went over the tools and the equipment. Also, you need to kind of, and we do, we're still working on this, going over our budgets. What do we need to replace and repair that's actually going to cost us more money if we keep it? So, yes, that tool works, but it's broken half the time. So, you know, looking at your equipment and seeing what is actually cheaper to buy new and get rid of old pieces of junk equipment that you spend more time, you know, fixing and repairing than you actually use. So you definitely want to do an inventory and look at that. And then simple things like rakes and shovels and wheelbarrows and wheelbarrow tires and handles and um, 
your basic, basic tools, tarps, you know, just go through those. We always like starting with some new tools in the spring. Uh, it just makes the crew feel a little bit better, you know, especially tools that they're going to be using all the time. Rakes are pretty inexpensive. So if it has four or five broken teeth on the rake, you know, get rid of it, get a new rake, let your team have a nice new high. We call them high speed rakes because they have all the, the uh, teeth. Um, Versus, you know, when they miss two or three or four on each side. Yeah, I know something else that you guys do, uh, which I love, and, and we have several clients that do this too, is you look over your trucks and your equipment that is going to be out there in the community and viewed by your clients, and you do a refresh. So it's like you'll touch up, you know, the paint, you know, you'll take off, you know, certain scuffs and various things, you know, that are obvious and kind of bring down the visual aesthetic of your, uh, your trucks and, you know, your branding and things like that. And you just give it kind of like this, you know, spring touch up, which one, I know it makes your team feel better about, you know, hey, you guys invest time in this, you care how it looks. They feel very proud being associated with that brand and that image. Um, and it takes the time that, you know, showing your your team, like, hey, we care about these things and we need to take care of them, giving them that just that little refresh every every launch. Yeah, it's a big part in 2007 when the economy crashed and the world was, you know, falling apart. Um, that winter, we repainted all of the sideboards and redid the signage that we needed to do to show people in our community that, you know, our business was still healthy. We weren't going out of business. I think half the landscapers in our market went out of business during that kind of 2008, 7, 8, 9, 10 crisis. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but we grew, we grew double digits. And part of that was the signage, refreshing the signage and painting the sideboards on the trucks and anything that was damaged, getting that fixed. And people want to work in trucks that look decent and customers they want, they don't need the perfect truck in front of the house, but they definitely want to feel like you're paying attention to your equipment, especially your vehicles. Um, if you're going to be charging, you know, the prices that you should be charging, they don't want to see a piece of junk out in front of their house. Now they don't need to see brand new, but they need yeah. to see that there's been some attention to it. And we just, we had a, we hired a company this year to do uh, the interior of the trucks, um, you know, and he spent about a week doing uh, 10 trucks for the uh, lawn science uh, department. And, you know, professionally cleaned, he does all the glass, he has the steamer and all the professional tools. And our guys could have done it, but he does a professional job. And uh, it's about $260 a truck. Um, so 10 trucks for $2,600. And uh, they're beautiful. And the guys who, you know, they're already like, wow, that's so nice having... He deodorizes it. He, you know, if there's any kind of fabric in there, he does a carpet cleaner on it. He steam cleans everything. And it definitely helps the guys uh, feel better about the truck because they're in that truck all the time. And when they clean it, they kind of do a decent job, but they're not, they don't have all the little brushes and the little tools to get in every nook and cranny. Yeah. So the next topic is staffing. And this is definitely something that in, any business, if you have growth coming up, you have a season coming up, you know, or you may have lost some of your team members, you know, during your down season, they move on. There's some turnover with that. So this is what you really want to get ahead of staffing and make sure that you know, what does your upcoming season look like? How many people are, you know, going to come back? Do we have the right amount of people? Do we have an increase in workload that we need to consider? So really making sure that you're dialed into how many people do we need to hire before we actually get out there and start the work. So you're not trying to do the work while you're trying to hire people to do the work. Yeah. So being aware of how many people you need to hire for each, like for your lawn mowing department or your lawn application or your landscape. And one of the things, you know, we're working on that right now, it's, you know, mid January and our ads will start going out. We need a couple of lawn techs. We need a lot, another landscape installer. We'll look to overhire 
uh, a little bit just to see who's going to who's going to stay, because even with the onboarding that we do, even with the um, the working interviews that we do, uh, you get people that after two weeks, they're like, this is too much work uh, or it's too windy or it's too cold or it's not what I thought it was. Um, so we just we over hire a little bit. But you have to decide where are you going to, you know. Are you going to use better teams? Are you going to use Indeed? Are you going to do flyers um, at the laundromats, gas stations? Are you going to, you know, ask your uh, team, you know, everyone who's on your team, do they, can they introduce you to someone? Are you going to put help wanted signs up in front of your shop and office? Are you going to, you, you might want to do all of this. Are you going to put a help wanted signs on your trucks as you're driving around? Um, but you need to make, really be intentional, make a list of the positions that you're going to hire for and all of the places that you're going to be um, letting people know, is it going to be on Facebook? I'm an advocate of letting many people know in different channels uh, as opposed to just relying on Indeed. Um, so I think, you know, the more lines you throw in the water, the more, the pickier you can be. You know, we only hire about one out of 20 people we interview uh, and they have to make it to, to the interview process. Um, so that's probably, you know, 20 out of 50 people make it to an interview and out of the 20 that we interview, one person gets hired. So we can be very choosy about who we're hiring. And that's part of why we have such high retention is because of that process. But, you know, now's the time to list out all the avenues you're going to be advertising, all the positions you're going to be hiring for, and uh, and then putting your milestones, the dates that you're going to start those ads, and also having a plan like when they contact you, you need to have a plan of who's going to interview them, who's going to get back to them. The process needs to be really quick because there are so many opportunities for people to work other places that you don't want to lose these people if they respond to your um your help wanted ad or your, your ads. Yeah. And the other thing I would say too, is making sure that you have an onboarding process with your new hire. So there's going to be that runway of hiring the right people. And then there's going to be the runway of onboarding the right people that you just hired. And this is what we have found a lot in the past is people will hire people and then they just say, okay, get in the truck and go work. And there's no thought about, well, how can we set them up for success, right? And how can they feel supported? And what do we need to teach them? Because this is how we do things in our company and these are our expectations. So making sure you have enough of that time before you throw them out just into the field to make sure they know, you know, what training do you want them to have? What expectations? What are their roles? How do things work? Where do they find things? You know, all the way down to, hey, this is what a typical morning looks like once we start our season. And, you know, here's the bathroom. You can put your lunch here or your snacks here or, you know, whatever it is, however you have your system set up, but making sure that you're intentional about onboarding these new hires that you just invested all this money into hiring. Yeah, I think, you know, onboarding done poorly is a huge reason that people don't stay at jobs and or, you know, just basic onboarding, like where to park, where's the bathroom, uh, basic information, sharing that up front uh, and also expecting too much too soon. You know, during any job that we start, the first two weeks are the most stressful because we're just learning like how the company works. There's lingo that different companies use. Um, you know, we would say when we did mowing, we would, you would hear somebody say, I had to double chew it on that lawn. Like, what does that even mean? Double chew. That means they had to go over the lawn twice to chew up all the clippings, but they wouldn't they would just say double chew it. Um, you know, we have a thing called, we, we call it King Tut means you did not do it because we would have a hard time mowed or didn't mow. We couldn't read it, but we know if so, if you say King Tut, um, that is just so far off of didn't do it or did do it that you know that it it's part of the company culture. So you'll see things KT KT that means King Tut. You didn't do it, but in so if you're talking to someone in your company, and you have this lingo or language, um, 
they don't understand it. They don't even know what you mean. And then we can get frustrated with them. And then they get frustrated with us. And then, and then they leave or they're already looking for a job. They're like, these people, I don't even know what they're saying. Um, so making sure you take the time to just give them the basic information. It doesn't have to be a really sophisticated onboarding process. And having them have a mentor or a best friend at work, assigning someone to them so they can just ask basic questions. Like one of the things that you need to know about me, if you work for me in the field, never come up to me and ask me where your gloves are. If you come up to me and ask me where your gloves are, you know, and you've been wearing them for a couple of days, um, we're going to have a conversation. Uh, so may, my team makes sure everyone knows don't leave your doors open on the truck unless you're in the truck and don't go ask Steve where your gloves are. Um, and, I, you know, it's just one of my pet peeves. I'm like, I don't know where it, where your gloves are. Where did you leave them? Um, what, and why are you asking me? Uh, and it's probably not the best way to handle it, but it's one of those things that people have done it to me over the years where I'm just like, I, it's like my kids, you know, dads, where, where's my shoes? I don't know. Where did you leave them? Like, so, um, we all have our little pet peeves. So you want to make sure whatever yours are, get communicated to your new hires. And then you also want to make sure that you have, you know, the people that you do have, and then the new hires, you have their shifts figured out. They know when they're working, what the expectations are. They're aware of the tasks, whether this is someone in the field, you know, a team lead or an office person, you want them to know what the expectations are with their tasks and, you know, when those tasks should occur. So, you know, what is the, the schedule, the cadence, um, and what are they assigned to? Like, what are they responsible for? So having those conversations you know, with your new hires uh, before they even get started and not in the midst, again, of launching your season, right? You don't want all the chaos happening around you and these new people coming up and asking these questions or, you know, even clarification. You want them to at least know, I would say, 60 percent uh, before you are in the heat of your season and launching it. Yeah, write out your job description and your job, your role expectations. And they can just be basic points. You don't need to go into everything. Open the door. Put your foot on the truck. Put your other foot in the truck. Use your hand. Don't do that. You know, just make sure they understand the role of that. The mission of that role is to do this, right? Or to do that. Just make sure they understand what the mission of that role is. Like if it's, you know, the job foreman, you know, what are, what are the, what's the mission of that foreman for the day, for the week? Then you don't have to tell them how to like put the gate down and fill it. You know, if they're a foreman, they shouldn't know how to fill the uh, mowers up or the Z sprays up with gas, but you just want to make sure they understand the mission and they can figure out how to get there. The next one is one of my favorite ones. It's called marketing and branding. Uh, and you know, one of the things I came up with is bank balance marketing. Again, you know, one of these bank balance things that are marketing kind of ideas, budgets, concepts, and program is based on how much we have in the, our bank account. And again, Profit First solves that issue. And you can be more intentional in implementing a true marketing and branding uh, plan because you have the money when you need it to be there. So you know, making sure. So one of the biggest things we want to make sure is our website is correct and up to date. I was just working with one of our clients yesterday. He's uh, eliminated two services, but it's still on the front of his landing page on his website. So we have to get those services off that website. And we want to make sure all our services that we're going to be providing are on the website. We also want to make sure, you know, the website's up to date. And uh, it's not super slow and people cannot move around on it. We want to make sure that our phone number is on the website um, because a lot of our current clients actually will search us and they're really looking for the phone number. They're not going to do a form fill. They, Mrs. Jones just doesn't remember our phone number. So she looks up, you know, lawn science and there, boom, we want her to find that phone number really quickly. So make sure your phone number is large and easy to find on the website. And if, you know, also check and make sure that your um, website is showing up on your on the phones, on mobile. You want to make sure you have a mobile friendly website uh, because that's, yes. you know, over 65 percent of searches are done on your on a mobile phone. Um, 
uh, not a, a wire phone, right? I don't, is there a mobile phone and then there's a stationary phone? I don't think so anymore. <laughs> yeah. If most people remember phones, it used to be connected to with cords. Yeah, I look up most of my information on my cell phone. So the only time that I'm Googling anything and it has to do with business is when I'm sitting here, that happens on a computer. Otherwise, I am on my cell phone Googling it, trying to look up information. So you, yeah, you definitely want to make sure that your website, your Google My Business is updated. That information is kept updated with any uh, important links. And also online directories, like if you're part of any sort of online directory, making sure that that's up to date. Are you looking to take your business to the next level? Look no further than the Green Profit Academy Business Accelerator Kickstarter Workshop. In seven weeks, you'll learn the critical skills necessary to define and achieve your goals, including developing a mission, vision, and purpose. You'll also explore immutable laws, benchmarks, goal setting, and create your very own strategic business plan. With this comprehensive program, you'll be able to set achievable goals and develop a roadmap for success, accelerate your business growth, meet your objectives, and achieve long-term sustainability. Go to growgpa.com forward slash GBAKW to sign up for our GPA Business Accelerator Kickstarter Workshop today. Again, that's growgpa.com forward slash GBAKW. Use promo code GBAKW100 to receive $100 off the workshop today. The other thing is, you know, what type of promotional materials, like where are you going to invest your money this year? What do you need? Are you, is your clients more web-based? Is that more of your ideal customer? Are they, do you need to send out flyers and brochures? Like how do you communicate with not only your current customers that you may want to re-sign, but also the customers that you want to work with are potential leads or customers, you know, out there in the field and know, you know, where do you need to spend your marketing dollars that gets you the most ROI? Yeah, I could talk about this for the next like two hours, but marketing is such an important part. And it, it starts really, you know, with how your crews show up out in the public. Like, do they look professional? They don't have to have the fanciest uniform, but do they look like a, a real company? Do the trucks look real? Um, you know, is does somebody uh, answer the phone? Does somebody call people back? You know, if you're known as the landscape or any contractor that answers the phone or calls people back, you're already ahead of like... 50 or 60 percent of anybody in your market um and you know that could be a tagline we call you back um but you want to make sure you don't want to get too too fancy make sure your trucks are lettered and logoed make sure there's phone numbers on that make sure there's a website on your truck make sure your uh your people have decent looking uniforms they don't have to be brand new all the time um those are basic marketing things you know and as silly as it sounds make sure you have a business card either a paper business card. They're so cheap. It's ridiculous uh, to get business cards or digital business card or both. Um, you know, make sure that you're reaching out to your current client list. Some people are so uh, uh, involved in like trying to get new customers, but really we're seven times more likely to sell to our existing clients than a person we've never worked with. So making sure that you're marketing to your existing clients uh, at least a few times a year to say, Hey, just reminder, we do these services. We can provide these services to you and, and let them know what you do. Because a lot of times, if we do one thing for them, they don't consider us for other things, but we could do other things for them. Um, so make sure that we market to our existing clients. And about a third of your marketing budget should be towards existing clients. And most people have zero or maybe less than 5%, but really it should be about 33% should be to, towards your existing clients, marketing marketing just to them and in showing them some appreciation. So again, with the marketing, you wanna have milestones and you wanna have timelines because right now, if you're gonna do 100,000 inserts or 100,000 handouts or mailers, you have to get it designed. Then you have to get it printed. You know, So it's two weeks to the design 
two weeks, three weeks for the printer. Now, if you're going to mail it out in EDDM, it's another five to seven days. So we're just, we're talking a month and a half right there. So if it's going to go out, you know, March 15th, you, you have till the end of January. Um, you know, and if it's going to go out, um, April 1st, you know, you have to the middle of February, but you need to know when these deadlines are. We can't wait until they're, you know, it's April 1st and they're like, oh, I see it all the time on the Facebook groups. And some people really get, you know, they hammer these guys or it'll be the first week, of April. I'm thinking about advertising. What do you think I should do? It's too late. Like you should pay attention to this year and then be ready for next year. But we don't want to be that that person that's like, you know, asking silly questions in April about advertising and marketing that needs to be taken care of in January and February. Right. And then our next one, which I, I love this is it's pricing, right? Pricing and services. Like what are you offering? You know, who is your ideal customer? Are there things in your services that you don't need to offer anymore? Have you looked at what your profit center is, you know, so all of those tie back to strategic business planning, but also raising your prices. That's important. I know as we are coaching through when, you know, COVID hit and companies were looking at their pricing structure, and then we had an increase in materials and labor and this and that they had an increase their pricing for years. So suddenly they were looking at their numbers and realizing that, the cost to do service wasn't going to gain them any profit margin unless they raised their pricing by X amount percent, which was they're like, all my customers are, they're just going to quit and they're going to go find somebody else. And, you know, so really being intentional about reviewing what services are you offering? What does it take for your company to provide those services? Is there something you should stop doing? Is there something you should start doing? And then really looking at your pricing structure for these services, how much does it cost, you know, for your technicians? How much does it cost for your equipment? What are the material costs associated with this? And, uh, you know, really tying that together. So being intentional, not just being emotional about your pricing or going, well, so-and-so charges this much. So I'm going to, you know, charge $5 less than him or whatever it is. So review and update your service packaging. Again, make sure it ties to your marketing, make sure it's targeted to that ideal customer you want to serve in your area, in your market. So you don't want to go outside of your market because that could be lost opportunity cost right there. And then, you know, just looking at, uh, are we going to make a profit on this? And do we need to increase our pricing when it comes to our services? And I'm finding that, the majority of time people don't increase their pricing. It's because they're, they don't know their cost and they just, Oh no, people will get upset. If we raise their prices, you know, only two and a half to 3% of clients will quit over price increases, which is what people think everybody's going to quit. The challenge is that it's so risky for customers to quit over a three or 5% price increase, you know, so like if you go up $1 per thousand square feet, it's a 10,000 square foot lawn and they're going to quit over $10. Now they have to take the risk of finding a new vendor. They, they know you, they know what your company's about. They have your phone number and your name. You're in the community. Now they're for $10. They're going to roll the dice and try to find a new person or $7 a cut or whatever it is. You know, it's so risky to try to find a new vendor and uh, get a new person. You don't know them. You don't know. They're coming to your house. Um, they, you don't know what they're going to deliver, how well they're going to do now. And, you know, I've done it. Other people have done it. Ah, oh, that's it. They went up 10 bucks. I'm going to get somebody new. And I get the new person and they're not very good. And my wife's going, why did you get rid of the other company? Oh, wow. They were up $10. And then she's like, so I have to put up with this for $10. And I'm like, oh, oops. Uh, yeah, not a good idea. So a lot of people have learned that lesson. If they're hiring us, they've learned a lot of life lessons like that. So they're willing to pay and you can just explain it to them in a really basic way. The cost went up. It costs us more to deliver this. We still want to work with you. And this is what the new cost is. So I've been through this. You know, we know it was very interesting. 
back in the 2000s, we had customers we didn't raise the prices at for like four or five years. And they still called and complained about the price increase that didn't even exist. We're like, no, it's the same price. So they make their own narrative up. Um, so you just got to realize that we need, we all need to charge what we have to charge. Um, but you have to have kind of the, uh, the strength to be willing to charge that and just realize that your really good customers will stay with you and the people probably who shouldn't. I mean, we raised someone's price $20 and he's probably called five or six times. Now he just needs to go away. It's $20, my friend. Um, so go away. Uh, and that's hard for them to hear because they think we're desperate for their $20. But, you know, we're not. We're desperate to support our company and grow in a really profitable and sustainable way so we can stay part of the community and support our clients and our, our team, right? So if you got to raise your prices, raise your prices. But you got to find out if you need to raise your prices. And if you're not making money and you're working hard every year, and you're kind of like, this is crap. 10 years, I should be further ahead. I should be making more money. Then, you know, that's kind of your sign to raise your prices. Yeah. Yeah. And and it goes into our ne next uh, topic, customer management, but that communication, and, and we've talked about this several times, Steve, in coaching calls and on webinars, where if we don't provide that narrative, they're going to create their own. And this falls in customers, this falls in with our team members, this falls in with family members, like any other human on this planet that you're communicating with. If you don't provide the narrative, they're going to create their own. So really, if you're gonna raise your prices, just provide the narrative. It is important to us to continue to provide you high quality service without cutting any corners. Therefore, we have to increase our prices by X amount. So we're making, you know, it about the customer, how much we care about them, how we're not willing to sacrifice. And if somebody has a complaint about that and they want to call in, talk about how we're not willing to sacrifice and, the, you know, the quality of service is important. So we're continuing to create that narrative. The people that you don't want to service are going to go somewhere else. So you can make more money doing less with better customers than dealing with all of the chirpers. So like I say, just go for it. You'll make a higher profit margin in the end. And I don't know about anyone else, but I know I have to pay my people more money than I ever had to pay them, right? But you, it's still hard to find people. We're paying more, but it's still difficult to find team members to grow the business or to keep people. So, you know, gone are the days where you can low pay and people come to work. And our clients, you know, if they're used to that kind of economy, now they're kind of getting used to where there's restaurants are closed certain days because they don't have enough people. Businesses are, you know, reducing services because they don't have enough people. So we're going to have to pay people more. We're going to have to charge a little bit more. But you get better people by paying more. You get higher quality. You get, you know, so much better experience for the client and the company by having people that you can pay better, right? We don't want the lowest paid employees working at our houses, right? We want, if we have tradespeople at our house, we want people that are, you know, really good and kind of want to get paid well. We don't want to have the bottom of the barrel. At least, you know, majority of people, they don't. Um, so, yeah. right. But make sure that you know how much you have to charge. And uh, a lot of people are cheap. A lot of, you know, they, it, it's just fine. Let them be cheap somewhere else and, uh, and go get the customers that are going to appreciate you. And we had this conversation yesterday with my team. It's I wouldn't pay that much for that because I can do it myself. But the challenge is a lot of our customers, they don't want to do it. Even if they could do it, they have more fun stuff to do. You know, they have nice homes. They have activities. They have grandkids. They have kids. They have golf, boating. I mean, they have all kinds of stuff. They don't want to do it. And to give them the freedom of like every time I come home, my lawn's cut. The lawn's fertilized, it's weeded, the beds are beautiful, you know, mulched, edged, trimmed. Um, there's so much value to that, to, to a very particular group of people. They really appreciate that. Yeah, so when we invest in our team, our team invests in our customers and they give them the best care. So we always want to make sure, you know, with our customers, as we're continuing to work with them, especially if they re-sign 
you know, communicate what's coming to them, right? So you want to make sure that you're updating your customer database, you're ensuring that the contact information is accurate. So when you do communicate, it's actually getting to them, you know, their preferred uh, source of communication. Some people like email, some people like phone calls, some people like text messages, uh, you know, also, you may need to contact some of your customers in advance and communicate, hey, we're going to be out there at this time. We're launching the season. This is what it's going to look like, you know, anything like that. Um, I would also suggest if you don't have a prepay system in place to get one in place so you can have uh, some place for your customers to re-sign, you know, make it easy for them. Remove the friction points so it's not hard for them to pay you for the services that they want to continue. And then also, uh, if you don't have a customer referral program, because if we're really taking care of our customers, they like to brag. They like to say, oh, I've got the best lawn care guy or my landscape you know, company did this and they like to talk about it. So having a customer referral program you know, in place to leverage that word of mouth and that, you know, bragging or you should use my landscape or lawn care guy, you know, is definitely beneficial because it's, you know, cheap marketing. You're going to get a higher, higher ROI with your ideal customers referring ideal customers to you than you would pay with an advertisement out there. Absolutely. Yes. Um, so the next the, is uh, safety uh, and insurance, and we want to go over and make sure that we have enough insurance. I'm meeting with my insurance man next week uh, to make sure we have all the coverage that we're supposed to have and the amounts we're supposed to have it. Now, we're not going to renew until uh, the end of May or June, but I'm busy at the end of May and June. So, you know, we want to make sure uh, when I have a little more time now, we can spend a couple hours going over all of the policies and everything, and even the contract, uh, how we write contracts to protect ourselves in situations of liability. And we don't want to overcommit and make ourselves more liable than we need to, making sure also that old equipment is not on our insurance. We don't want to be paying uh, insurance on equipment we don't even have. Yeah. And that's a good point is we see this all the time on the bookkeeping side is we're looking at their asset list and we're saying, you know, helping them get prepared for their taxes. And we're going, well, we need this or we need that. And they're going, oh, well, we haven't had that vehicle for like two years. And, you know, so yes, making sure that your equipment is logged as far as like what is on your insurance policy, what is on your books, um, reviewing the policy stipulations, policies change year after year. And especially in these times, it's, you know, they're certain for certain states, they change policies because of different laws that go into play. So making sure that you're compliant and that you're covered. And that's a, a really great point is making sure that if there is something in your engagements or your contracts that you're having with your, your customers that they sign, making sure that you're covered because you don't want verbiage to be missing where something happens and your insurance policy could have covered you. So making sure that that's compliant. And also I would say this is a great opportunity to, you know, when it comes to safety is reboarding your team members that have been off all season or maybe haven't been working, you know, in that area of service. So, you know, review what you do, why you do it. It's a great time to have them update any of their contact information, review company policies, you know, go through a little bit of an onboarding training program with your team and make sure that they are practicing safety. They're familiar, you know, with whatever regulations that you have in place and that, you know, their say driver's license are updated, you know, and they haven't been suspended. What if they're driving a truck? and get in an accident and you find out they have a suspended driver's license. So really kind of checking the boxes and getting them reconnected with safety instructions um, and expectations when it comes to their work and how they're showing up on the job. 
Yeah, reboarding is a big part in our company because just making sure all their tax information is filled out, if anything's changed, the mailing addresses, so they understand how to get back into their, if they've been laid off, into their payroll portal, if there's any changes in the payroll portal. Um, and even the, my team that, you know, they don't get laid off, they work year round. The reboarding is always helpful because they're like, oh yeah, I forgot about this. What about our simple IRA? What's involved in that? In um, di different ways. Um, we also provide resources for people, like if they want to get certain accounts open, like a, a health savings account, or, um, you know, they need to get health insurance or other things we're not qualified to help them with. We also provide a list of resources for people that can, uh, also, you know, responsibilities as far as expectations for each one of the, uh, the team members. Um, so reboarding is a big part of, um, our company, we do it every year with every single person that works here. Um, next, we want to talk about supply chain inventory. We want to revisit the list of our suppliers um, and just recheck the prices, um, recheck like the agreement, the salespeople. Sometimes you'll get a new salespeople person and um, there's just no relationship or communication. We have vendors we dealt with for 20 years and a new salesperson comes and that's the end of the relationship just because we're too far for them to deal with or they just get distracted with something else and we don't hear anything from them. Um, but you definitely want to check with your suppliers, see if there's any new terms or conditions, update all of your, you know, your tax forms. We're getting those out to our, um, our vendors this year. So for the sales tax, um, and price list and contact situations or information, um, making sure that they have the right contact here. Uh, we had a, a vendor that was sending invoices to the wrong emails. And, um, you know, we, we were three months past due on this account. And he didn't figure out. I said, hey, we never paid that bill. And we looked it up and contacted him. He goes, yeah, I wondered why that wasn't paid. You guys aren't like that. And because he had the wrong emails, because, um, you know, we're American landscape and lawn science. You know how many American landscapes there are in some capacity? And it's, a, you know, I chose that name year 30 something years ago. Uh, it's a very general name. So people will just send stuff to the wrong email. So make sure that they have all your email contact and information. Go over pre-orders, materials, leverage discounts. You know, there's a big, big early order discount that happens. It used to be till the end of October for lawn care. Uh, and now they extended it even up until the uh, beginning of January. Make sure that you're taking care of those discounts and, uh, and getting your, um, material inventory checked with them again, not waiting. You know, I kind of, I kind of laugh. We have 2024 bought already for the whole year. I'll see post the third week of, um, of March guys looking for fertilizer in uh, pre-emergence and where the best pricing is. And they should be putting that down, you know, that week or the following week and they're just getting pricing. Um, so, you know, and then they end up paying top dollar because they're buying it like at peak season, they're going to pay anywhere between four to $6 more bag at that time than if you buy it uh, early order in the previous year. Next is scheduling, routing, planning, determining your efficient routes, systems to minimize travel time. I just had a great conversation uh, with one of our clients this week. He was going over, I have him go over the days and track numbers. And um, this this one crew only drove about 150 miles for the whole week. That was their whole week driving. But they went to the gas station every single day. Um, and the ga that truck gets about 270 to 300 miles per tank. So why are they going to the gas station? It was just a habit. They would go get coffee, sandwiches, and stuff like that. But it was a ha it was 30 minutes every day. So two and a half hours a week for two guys, five hours a week. So he's going to, he's work. He's just became aware of it. So he's going to work on fixing and making that more efficient. Yeah. And, you know, some of the things too, that comes up is routing systems. It's one of the things that um, I have become familiar with is the different software systems out there. And I love software. I love efficiency. I love integrating things, streamlining them, 
And there are several software systems out there now that they use the software to route and it's the most effective way to do it. And you don't need a master router in your company, you know, like the one guy that knows how to route these magic, you know, routes, like you could actually use the software and train people on the software and how to route. And there's different, you know, um, filters and stuff that you can build into it as well. And uh, as well as, you know, clients who might want to be serviced on a certain day or something like that, you know, so all the little variables you can consider with your routing system and the minimize travel. Also, another thing, and I know, Steve, this is something you've done in your business is determine and assign like the right team member on the routes that they're most effective and efficient in. So you have some guys that can do really small lawns fast and others that do better in, you know, larger lawns. So really knowing like where are their strengths and placing them on that route that really serves their strengths because they're more efficient and that's going to give you a higher profitability, you know, on that route. In higher quality because they love doing it. Absolutely. And with the routing, it's very, so they had black box routing, it was called. And then that was kind of like your basic, you'd punch in the addresses and hit it and it would route it, but it didn't have the ability to put you on the right side of the street. So if you're treating mm-hmm. lawns, you know, if you're spraying lawns, you you want your hose to be on, you want to park on the right side of the street. So it would route it. It didn't matter. It didn't figure it out. So we would have to go in and figure that out. Now they have dynamic routing and it figures out how to keep the truck on the proper side of the street. So it's parking legally. Um, so the dynamic routing is even better. Um, and it can figure out, you know, mow days, skip days, service days. There's just so much, uh, you can put into that. And I know one of our clients in Ohio, he shared, it used to take between five to six hours a day to, to route all of his texts. And with this dynamic routing, they have it down to about an hour and then they spend a half an hour tweaking it for eat the, the tech. Uh, so they went from five to six hours to an hour and a half a day um, for all of his texts. I mean, just an amazing, and it's better. I mean, it's so much better that um, they, they're they knocking up to two weeks around off um, because it's so much more efficient. And of course, his techs are asking, why didn't we do this before? This is so much easier and better. Um, so actually, you know, having that technology is saving everybody and they're able to service, you know, the same amount of customers with less techs. Again, hiring people is a challenge. So if you can service the same amount of uh, customers with fewer techs, um, you can pay your techs more. Uh, and uh, you have the same tech on the lawn uh, each time they go there. Customers are happier. Quality goes up. It's it's really a win, win, win. Yeah. Our next one is communication, which some of us are really, really great at. And some of us are not, it's not our strength at all. So making sure that, you know, and maybe you're not the champion of this. Maybe you need to assign somebody else to make sure that this happens. So make sure that all your staff are aware of the company policies, procedures, safety guidelines. So again, this ties into that reboarding process. Even if you don't have a down season, you know, pick a time in the year where you have that seasonal shift to where you can make that time and space for reboarding your team members. Um, Also, we suggest holding uh, team meetings to discuss upcoming seasonal goals, expectations, changes, making that space to maybe train or improve, you know, the quality of service with your team and connect with the team lead. It doesn't have to be long. It can be five minutes a day before they, you know, go out into the field. You know, it could be a lunch break, whatever it is, just making sure you're having those conversations and also, you know, review or even establish channels of communication. Like, what do we use? Where should this be? You know, how should we communicate? And uh, it might be in a new scheduling app. It might be in a new, you know, service software app. It might be in a, you know, Teams message type setting, whatever is that you use, just going over the, you know, communication level with and expectations and level of transparency that you want, not only with your team, but also your team with your customers. You know, sometimes you'll have somebody who communicates too much to a customer, and then you'll have that other person who communicates too little. So really identifying that sweet spot and outlining it. 
Yeah, communication is a huge part of, uh, you know, owning a company. And if you're not into communication, have somebody in your company who is into communication. And that's with, you know, our team have those meetings at the beginning of the season. The smaller the meeting I have found, the more effective it is. When we have 30 people there, um, people are not paying attention. People are distracted. Some people don't want to be there. So I try to break it down to groups of about three to four people uh, and they can have them kind of have input on the meeting. I don't want to be up there just, wah, 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 wah. you know, if you have three or four people, have them kind of run the meeting and you can you be there for support. Uh, and also decide how you're going to communicate and what the expectations are for your clients and let them know ahead of time and commit to that. You know, we're going to call you back within 48 hours, within 24 hours. We're going to call you back the same day. Whatever that is, make sure that you commit to that and you let your team know that that's the expectation. And also letting our team know, you know, if you're text by the company or by someone in the company, what's the expectation as far as returning that text? Is there yeah. a time expectation? Is there a uh, amount of information? Um, you know, we don't, it's not helpful when we get ghosted, um, you know, or when we ghost people, we don't get back to people. Just letting people know, I got your text. Um, let me think about that. I'll get back to you by the end of the day. You know, that's really a powerful way to communicate. We don't always have to have the answer like right away in that very second. It's OK if we say, you know, let me think about that. I'll get back to you tomorrow morning or whatever the response is. But just letting people know that you heard them, that you got their message. And it's a pain. I get it. I mean, I got people Facebook messaging me. I've got them texting me. They're emailing me. They're calling me. Um, they're leaving messages at my office. They're telling my team to tell me stuff. Um, and that goes for the whole company. And people are slacking. You know, we use Slack in the company. People slack message. So they're getting it from all angles. And that's just the way it is now. Um so we have to really define and have boundaries on when emails, right? We can't sit there all day and answer everyone's email as they come in. So setting up boundaries. Hey, look, I answer emails, you know, uh, at the end of the day, I, I return my phone calls between, you know, three and five and letting people know the boundaries. And that kind of helps us to stay focused, but set that up at the beginning of the season. Yeah, I'd also say, and this is something that I work on my team with quite a bit because, you know, we're, we are task people, right? So uh, we want to, in meetings and in, you know, group settings, we can identify a problem. We're not here to solve it. So that's when your meetings can go too long. The communication can go too long. So really keeping everybody, you know, on board with that expectations we can solve the problem or identify the problem. We are not going to solve it. We'll set up another time to solve it or we'll get the right person to solve it. So I think as you know, humans, we really love to solve problems. We love to provide solutions, especially when we're engaged. So creating that boundary around identifying problems, not solving them. And it saves a lot of time when you're getting together in meetings, you're communicating expectations, you know, communication, uh, you know, with customers or other team members is really identifying. Identifying problems take, take seconds. Solving them takes a lot more. So let's create the right space and time to do that. Yeah. When we think we have to solve problems instantly, we have to have the answers right now. It doesn't allow us the time and space to develop the very best way to deal with that and to solve it. Um, you know, we're not like, we're not slot machines where we're giving instant, you know, rewards out here. It takes time. If it's a serious issue or concern, uh, we want to make sure that we, um, we take the time that it needs and deserves. Yeah. The next is quality control review systems for quality control. Like what does that even mean? Right. Quality control. That means performing our task at a, a certain level and acceptable or beyond an acceptable level. And we want to make sure that we know what those tasks are um, like, lines when you're mowing, right? So what's important to your team? What are letting them know what's important? Blowing the driveway off completely, like not kind of blowing it off. Um, explaining like these are the expectations. This is what quality control means, right? Mowing with sharp blades. So that means we're gonna sharp we're gonna change those blades 
every day, every other day, depending on the quality of the steel and the mower. But letting your team know what quality is, is the easiest way to have high quality. Yes. All right. The last one we're going to talk about is continuous improvement in evaluation. Yeah. And this is something we do every year, right? Like business, it's a journey. It's, you know, we're always improving like, hey, our, 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 you know, how we're tracking things and reporting things. Is that efficient? Is the system we're using efficient? What changed? So really setting targets for your business growth and measuring those, you know, periodically is important. It's not something you always want to have, you know, your head in. You want to go back to it and reflect on it and see, is it working? You want to gather the data and analyze it, whether it's customer feedback, your numbers on your gross profit margin, your revenue growth, your number of, um, you know, customers that you service, the expenses, you know, in the company. So what can you do to improve those areas? And this, again, it's making time, right? So this checklist is really about making time and being intentional. Don't try to get it in all at once, right? If there's a bunch of things where you're like, I am not doing all that stuff. I don't have time to do all that stuff. Great. Pick what's most important, right? Again, it's a journey. And then another thing is stay up to date with industry trends. Like this industry is changing fast. You know, we have regulations being implemented in certain states where it's like gas equipment is not going to be allowed anymore. Gas mowers, blowers, things like that. You're having to change to battery. So navigating that and staying in front of it to where it's not the end of, you know, the year and you're going, oh, well, we don't have any battery operated equipment and we're not going to be able to use those gas mowers next year. So really looking at the industry's trends, staying in front of them and looking for opportunities to diversify your services and adopt new technology. I know people don't like to change, you know, but in this industry, there is a lot changing and some of it for the better, not just for our planet, but for the efficiency in your business. And there's a lot of tools out there that you can leverage that can increase your profit margin. So really just being intentional about where is room for improvement, and what do we need to know that we don't know? Yeah. And for improvement, like setting targets for business growth and measuring that progress periodically, you know, we should be doing that quarterly. But we definitely want to know what was our total revenue last year and what did we get paid as the owners of the company? Because we want to make sure we that trend is going in the right direction. And just having more revenue doesn't mean more profitability. So you want to know what your net income was and also be tracking that. So just those three numbers right there, total revenue, net income, and owner's pay are three numbers that you sh you know are a must tracking um, so we understand uh, what you know, we want to move toward and we want to improve on. So, you know, at least come up with those numbers and track those quarterly. And quarterly just means every 90 days. So we want to set times in our calendar when we're going to track that. We can't be too busy as uh, if you're the owner of the business, we can't be too busy to run the business and run our, our uh, you know, revenue. Uh, pay attention to that. So I want to thank everyone for joining and listening today on what we need to do to get ready. There's going to be a list available to download. Christine was nice enough to put that in a PDF uh, format for you to download and to help you get ready to get your season going and make 2024, uh, you know, an incredible year, a uh, profitable year and uh, a little less stressful and more enjoyable. Yes. So we'll, Thank you for joining us, and we'll look forward to you being with us next time. Thanks for listening to the Green Profit Academy Pros Podcast. The show that digs into the challenges of growing a lawn care and landscape business while maximizing your profit. Mm -hmm.